Welcome to a special pledge edition of The Treatment. My guest is writer-director Paul Thomas Anderson. His new film is There Will Be Blood, an adaptation of Upton Sinclair's Oil. P.T., thanks for coming back. Thank you. I should ask you to tell the audience what the movie's about. The movie is about an independent oil prospector named Daniel Plainview and his battle with a young preacher named Eli Sunday, his battle with himself and the, the relationship that he has with his young adopted son, H.W. The book's very much about that sort of distance between he and his son and having that third-person narration, and you chose to not have narration here or have a, a, a narrator commenting on things. Right. Well, quite honestly, I didn't. I never ever, I never felt or realized that I was officially going to adapt the book. I just, I, I kind of felt like I had this enormous amount of ter- material, the book being one thing, other bits and pieces of a script that I had been working on. What was that script? It was a script about fighting families, too. It was sort of, a, you know, Hatfields and McCoy, but it didn't really have anything. There was nothing. I was just sort of fishing for something. Um, I just had a premise. But I had a couple good characters and a couple good bits of dialogue, but not much else. In addition to that, I had tons and tons of photographs of the oil fields in California. and So I felt like I was pulling from all these different sources, my imagination as well, and you're just sort of mixing, mixing all those things together. And I never really felt like I was attacking it as a straight adaption. Mm-hmm. You know, and I had enough scenes from the book where I felt like, you know, I really owe the, I, I owe, I owe, I owe this book a lot to, 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 to have gotten us where we got. I mean, then I went about getting the rights to it, which is kind of funny. Really, it was, all, the whole thing was sort of ass backwards. And I, you can't really call it an adaptation because you use chunks of it, but mm-hmm. it's not ordered the same way the book is at all. I mean, right. it's it's much more chronological, and sort of builds on that unspoken bond between the two, between father and son. And I wondered about those scenes at the very beginning. When uh, he's traveling with his infant son and there's no dialogue between them, that to me seems like the most daunting thing to do because you're relying on an enormous amount of audience identification given we don't really know, or for the audience, they don't really know what his motives are. It was very undaunting. It was completely liberating. It was great to to do things without dialogue. Um, I can't tell you the pleasure we had in cutting dialogue out. You know, it's very easy to overwrite when you're alone in your room. You know, you're always going to kind of make a little bit more out of it than you need to. And I suppose that's probably a good idea to to kind of walk into a set armed with a little bit more than you might need. But I know I've been guilty in the past of not being able to recognize what, what didn't need to be there, you know. And Daniel's a pretty terrific editor in that way, too. You, can kind you of mean read Daniel Day-Lewis? Day-Lewis. I mean, when you get him out on the road you realize how little you you do need. He just brings so much just by looking at him. Well, one of the things that I was so struck by in this, and I think you may have gotten even the spirit of a lot of this from the book, is that you talked about confidence. And a lot of that dialogue comes from people who know exactly what they want to say and don't waste any words, unlike your characters who are often in the past trying to explain themselves and not being any good at it. Yeah. It is really fun to write for people that know exactly what they're after, it comes quite easy because of the the, the initial in, in, introduction to to it, or the kind of the collaboration with the Upton Sinclair book. I really felt like it was like working with a collaborator, like somebody was really kind of guiding it to begin with. You know, I took that opening speech of Upton Sinclair's, and the only thing that I did to it was to take the accent off it. You know, drilling was he would he would do drilling. You know, there was a real kind of character to it. And I took that out only because I didn't want to impose an accent or dialect, you know, onto an actor. But to see it in black and white, to sort of type it out on my own and transcribe it, it was cheap, but it really sort of helped helped me sort of say, well, God, look how direct this writing is, look how direct this language is. He's really clear about what he's trying to say. It's the treatment. My guest is writer-director Paul Thomas Anderson. We're talking about his new film, There Will Be Blood, an adaptation of Upton Sinclair's Oil. But even... In the narration, there is a kind of simplicity and a sort of pointedness in that and descriptions that are kind of digressive. And you pair it all that away just so everything sort of points to these explorations of character, mostly through action. I mean, I'm reminded as much as kind of like a Walter Hill and early True Foe as I am of anything else I've seen that you've done before. Yeah, um, for whatever reason... That was the approach. Probably whether it was something that I thought would be a, a kind of great 
a great way to tell this story or it's just something that I felt like I hadn't I could do better, you know, kind of stripping things down to their their just just the essentials. I mean, one thing we used to do in the editing room was every Wednesday night we would get steak and vodka only, you know, no sides, no soda for the vodka. And we because we, we were constantly reminding ourselves like this is what the film should be. Is this a plain view? Yeah, you know, this is like you know it's a, it's a plain view. You know, he thought like we've got to get inside his head, and it's his story. I guess maybe that's the other thing in in kind of film language. You want to say, well, it's his story. But except in the last story, it becomes the story of the, the other two sons. I feel. I mean, it, it's his story for a good chunk of it. And at the point at which you've gone in terms of his evolution as far as he can go and we see him close off, then we're watching him from outside a bit, aren't we? Or are we? I never saw it that way. I never saw it that way. I mean, perhaps it feels that way because he is so far gone. The further he gets from any kind of sanity, he, probably the more and more you, you end up objectifying him. Um, but the further also he gets away from that thing that he's good at, being in the land with his hands. That's it. Yeah, that's – there you go. You helped me out because that's exactly it. It was obvious in looking around at these stories that these guys that started as silver prospectors were at the tail end of the wild, wild west. I mean they, they were part of a fever and part of you know the possibility of guns going off at any moment and that as they bridged into the 20th century – it was really quite difficult for them to kind of leave that behind or here they were, they amassed this enormous wealth, but they missed what they were really after the whole time, which was the game, the effort, the fever. What good were they? Yeah, God, it's got to be a horrible thing to get to the end. It's like, what happens when your dreams come true, you know? You keep it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but that sense of him being trapped in that house yeah. is so palpable in the last third of the picture, where he's a totally removed away from, from everything. He's lost touch with his son. And also, the thing that he communicates best with, the Earth, he's lost touch with that too. I mean, that's when it takes on these kind of tragic implications, or really tragic. Yeah, we had a scene that we wanted to shoot, but I, feel, I you, you kind of feel it anyway. We had a scene we wanted to shoot. We just ran out of time. But just to do a simple shot where Daniel, um, where it was clear that Daniel more or less lived in a tent inside the house, you know, probably with a few buckets around that he could do his business in, you know, and like a, maybe, a, the, you know, using the fireplace as a campfire. But that's the idea, yeah, showing that he's probably just very uncomfortable. I've, I've made a joke before, but it was true. We we had a, a sort of joke subtitle for the film that was, you know, you can take the boy out of the mine shaft, but you can't take the mine shaft out of the boy. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it would have been good if Paramount had gone with that, you know, in subtitles or something like that. But. Well, maybe for the French version. <clears throat> right. <laughs> but I'm fascinated by this because it really is about a man who has no need for people or cities, which had to be a wildly different kind of thing for you to do. I suppose, I suppose so, yeah. Um, I mean, I remember feeling, for whatever reason, in in a very abstract way... God, it would be terrific to make a film outside. And and looking at the photographs of the period and the oil fields of California at the time, it was just an irresistible world. And in terms of in terms of what might, might have appealed to me in the past of what to do is the history of my state, is the history of California. I mean, that, that in itself is irresistible too. So, oh, God, I wish I was back there making that movie right now. 